Good morning, everybody. It is great to see everybody here, and we have got a great day ahead of us. I am excited about having our college ministry here. Uh, MBSF stands for Missionary Baptist Student Fellowship. They took a trip to Arizona, and they're going to be sharing that with us, some uh, details about that. Also leading us in worship. So I'm going to get to be out there with you guys worshiping, uh, being led in worship this morning. I'm looking forward to that, and I'm excited about them. We're going to start things off this morning with a scripture from Numbers chapter 21, verses 7 through 9. The context here is when the people of Israel had uh, rebelled against God, and, and God had sent serpents among them, and the serpents were biting them, and people were dying from these, these bites from the snakes. And it says, Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he will take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for your blessings and for the opportunity to come together and to worship you. Thank you for our college ministry and the students who have come to uh, present what they have done, the, the great ministry and the great work. And Lord, I pray that you would bless them this semester as things are just getting started. I pray that you would give them great uh, comfort and encouragement in their school and uh, help them to learn and study and do the things that they need to do. And through it all, Lord, may they be good uh, witnesses for you. And Lord, I pray that you'd bless our church this morning, help us to glorify you in everything we do. If there's anything that would hinder our worship, Lord, please deal with that in us. Get it out of the way so we can just truly worship you uh, in spirit and in truth. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us, for the provision you've made for us, and for the healing and forgiveness we have when we look to Jesus Christ, our Savior. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, Bryce, you ready? All right. Thank you. 
everybody here this morning. I've got uh, Brother Scott's lapel on. You got me? Check. Check. Check one, two, one, two. Almost. Not muted. It. Check, check, check. It just wasn't close enough to my face, I guess. I made an adjustment. My face is a little fatter than Scott's. You think? <laughs> my mouth's definitely bigger, too. Check. You can get it right there. Everybody hear me good? All right. Good to see everybody. We've got a, we've got a crew of students here this morning. We want to share with you what's going on with MBSF. Uh, we're going to take just a, a, a break for just a minute from music, and I want to just talk to you about our mission trip, give you a little update on that. We do have a slideshow. Uh, this was uh, our T-shirt logo that we had. Um, so it wasn't really like the official trip logo, but it was for us, for our group. We had uh, three different groups go to Flagstaff uh, for an eight-day trip there. It was a 10-day trip in all. Uh, I think uh, with travel and everything, it was it seemed like a month, but um, we had a really good time. Uh, our our college group went. We had about 15 students from our group go. Then we had another group from Victory in Russellville. They have a college ministry there on on Tex campus, Arkansas Tex campus. They joined us uh, out there. They had a, a similar size group, and then there was. Um, a, a family from Barron Cross in Arkadelphia that went as well, a family of six. And then we also had two sponsors from Barron Cross for our group, which is Troy Garland and Billy Gar Garland. Troy Garland is a former MBSF director in Arkadelphia. And so we had a really great time uh, with this trip. Uh, while we were there on the trip, uh, I'm going to shut up and let some students talk in just a minute. But um, while we were there on the trip, we we basically had three three objectives the main objective was a sports camp that we did at the YMCA in Flagstaff uh, we went we had a uh, mission group 516 missions is sponsored by Pauline Baptist Church in Monticello Arkansas they organized this trip for us so a lot of the groundwork was done before the trip started and a lot of the planning for the trip was done before the trip uh, got going so when we got there, uh, most of these activities that we did were already organized and planned. So we were able just to kind of go in, do just a little bit of fine tuning with our groups, and then hit the ground running. Uh, we, we had around 60 to 40 kids show up. Um, it kind of fluctuated on, on the day. Some days there were lower numbers of kids. Some days there were higher number of kids. But at the YMCA, that's where we did the sports camps. Uh, I say sports camps, they were really kind of called X camps because we had some different tracks. So most of y'all are familiar with Vacation Bible School. It's a similar setup to that, except it was three days. And during that, during that time, uh, there, were, there were sports like basketball, soccer that they could, they could go and, and learn some tips on. We had some uh, students and adults there that were equipped to teach those, those sports. But then we also did uh, courses like in engineering uh, where they build model sets, and um, I didn't teach that class, so that was a little bit out of my depth, but it was really cool to see all the things they did, and, and we have some pictures of that in the slideshow, and you, you guys just go through those slides, um, just keep, keep running through those until we're done, uh, but um, I, I, I was able to teach one class, and there's some pictures of that. I did a survival class, which we actually taught, you know, some different techniques on, like, how to how to survive in the wilderness. Like, I got to drink dirty water through a straw, you know, one of those filtering straws, and uh, sh showed them how to tie, tie knots, and, and we showed them how to build a fire, and what you should carry with you, what happens if you run into a bear or a mountain lion, or we try to keep it local for that area, like what they're going to face if they go in the wilderness there. And... Uh, through that experience, you know, you learn a lot. Flagstaff is an area of the country where a lot of people spend their time outdoors. They would much rather go hiking in the mountains than go to a movie. 
And so uh, it was really neat to talk with those kids. A lot of the, the kids we had uh, were, were a Native American family and heritage. And then we had some kids that uh, moved in. It's kind of a melting pot area. Uh, nobody's from Flagstaff. They all moved there. Uh, matter of fact, in the church, uh, we actually met one person that was born in Flagstaff and raised there. They were members of the church there. Uh, so that was kind of neat, but this, the X camp, sports camps, that was kind of our main focus uh, for the week. But we did some other things. They were having flooding, a bad flooding issue while we were there. So we had an objective where we did sandbags and filled sandbags to help the community, to help redirect water and stop flooding. It's a bad problem uh, when they've had a drought for three years. The water hits the mountain, comes down, and it just pours into the town and, and ruins a lot of people's lives for a while. And so... It created a big opportunity for that, for that mission church and uh, for, the, uh, for the opportunities we had to minister. Another opportunity we had while we were there uh, was just to canvas the city, connect with some of the people, and uh, try to start up as many conversations as we could. And so we really had a good time, but uh, we actually had one of our students, uh, Andy and uh, Kim are going to come out. And y'all go ahead and come. They're going to use this blue mic. Uh, Andy actually did an internship with the missionary there all summer long, about five weeks. And uh, so she was the intern. I'm going to let her talk about that first. I want y'all to hear what her experience was as the intern there. Uh, Andy was one of our students that was saved back in, in last school year in November. And she was excited and ready to go to, the work, go to, go to work for the Lord. And so uh, we were able to connect her with this opportunity. Uh, that's part of the thing that MBSF does for our students is we try to find opportunities to plug them in where they can be useful and continue to serve the kingdom of God even when we're not in school. So uh, I'm so thankful for Andy. And then Kim's going to talk to you a little bit more about the sports camps and her experience with those, okay? Is it on? Good morning. <laughs> um, so my name is Andy, and I'm super excited to share with you what I did on the internship. But I'm a little, a little nervous, and so I'm going to be reading it off of my phone, so please bear with me. Um, so I started off the five-week trip um, at the American Baptist Association in Charleston, West Virginia. And then after the ABA meeting, we went to Bog Springs. So at Bog Springs, I facilitated and managed recreation um, alongside two incredible ladies, Ms. Uh, Kaylee Murray and Ms. Taylor Welchman. So Ms. Taylor Welchman um, was the family that I was helping over the summer. Um, and during the camp, we had 33 reported professions of faith and six rededications, which was absolutely amazing. Um, and then from BOG, we returned to Flagstaff, Arizona, where each Sunday I taught their children's uh, Sunday school, and it was pretty awesome. I also facilitated, I'm sorry, I also assisted a youth mission trip from Mount Zion Church, who went to Flagstaff to help the Welchman missionaries. Um, and with the Mount Zion kids, our primary focus was, focus was community outreach, and we achieved that through canvassing nearly 2,500 homes, um, working at the food pantry, making food boxes, as well as handing them out at an elementary school to families in need. So it was kind of like a, a drive-by. We would uh, pack the food into boxes, and it was enough. I think it was like five meals per box, and they would drive through, and they would ask for a certain amount of boxes, and we would just give it to them, and they would have enough food for however, for however long. Um, we also worked on church maintenance, community maintenance projects, um, and to our surprise, we did disaster relief because there was some terrible flooding that affected uh, a little over half of the city. And it was truly terrible, but it was kind of a blessing that the floods happened when they did because it allowed us the opportunity to help the city and to love on the city um, in their time of need. And then after the Mount Zion group left, I directed and managed another mission trip, which is uh, the Arkadelphia MBSF and the Victory Church from Russellville and then Bering Cross. And this group, I helped this group facilitate the Jesus and Me camp. And so that camp was for first through sixth graders. Uh, and during the camp, we taught six creative and active classes. And then we gave a devotional every day, um, kind of trying to teach the kids um, about God's love. And we got to minister to about roughly like 45 students, which was absolutely amazing because most of them had never heard um, who Jesus was, who is God. They don't know any of that. Um, and it was awesome. And this group also did some community service projects, um, including sandbagging and doing working at the uh, food bank. And both groups were such a blessing to the community, and I learned more than I thought I was going to over the five weeks 
Um, and I'm so glad, and I thank God for the opportunity to allow me to serve him in Flagstaff. Um, and I couldn't thank uh, Ascend MBSF enough for allowing me to connect with this family and go out and help them. Um, yeah, and so Kim is going to talk a little bit more in depth about what we did uh, during the Jesus and Me camps. Hey guys, so my name's Kim. Um, I went on the mission trip with Ascend. Uh, just a little bit about me. I grew up in church, I've been in church my whole life, but I've never gotten the opportunity to go on a mission trip. Um, so this was something like really special to me. Uh, I went in not really knowing what to expect out of it. Um, Brother Daniel did some training with us, and then when we got into Flagstaff, uh, Brother Sean kind of gave us some tips and stuff. Um, and I just went in kind of wanting to show my servant's heart. Like I wanted to serve that community. Um, but most of all, we wanted to show God's love to those people. Um, and I feel like especially in today's world, um, the world doesn't show love. Like if you're gonna if you're gonna give something to people, you expect something back in return. Um, and I really feel like our group went in um, just wanting to give love and not expecting anything out of it. Um, so that was really our focus with the jam camp, the Jesus and Me camp. Um, so like they said, we had six camps. We did three in the morning and three in the afternoon. Um, I helped out with the engineering camp, which is really awesome. You might see some pictures. We built like roller coasters. Um, they did like little sets where they got to build towers and bridges and stuff. Um, the kids were really awesome. They were so creative. But they were also really great at listening during our lesson time. Um, so we had about 15 or 20 minutes where we would, you know, teach a lesson um, focused on God's love, but also sharing the gospel with them. And the kids were just so amazing. They listened, you know, they sat there, eyes focused, um, and were just like really involved in it. Um, and it was so awesome to see kids that, you know, probably have never heard anything about God. Like the next day when you ask them what they learned, they'd be like, oh, God loves us so much, and you guys love us. And that was our goal out of this camp. Um, I, really, I really believe that the kids um, benefited from it. Um, I think they went out knowing that God loved them and that um, Flagstaff Family Church loved them, even us uh, random Arkansans that they didn't even know where we were from, that we loved them. Um, so I'm really thankful for this opportunity. Um, and I hope that just some kind of seed was planted in those kids' lives that um, will change them, that maybe they'll be saved from it, um, and just that they know that God loves them no matter what, no matter what comes out of it, no matter what happens in their life. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I just want to wrap, wrap up just a few things. Um, Andy mentioned uh, the food bank, which I forgot to mention. There were pictures of that. Uh, that was part of our community outreach. And uh, the, the director of the mission trip that we had, her name is Ashley Ridings. Uh, she just recently married a pastor in Texas. And so she was in the middle of transitioning from a new mission project called Passageway Missions from 516 Missions. We're going to continue to work with her next summer. We're already in the plans of making a mission trip uh, for Costa Rica or Belize somewhere, either one of the two. And uh, we're going to try to take more college students next year, try to get more college ministries involved. Uh, the original plan uh, for me and Kelly Roach were to try to plan a mission trip that college students, it would emphasize college students going together and serving, even if we're from different groups, different different towns. Um, this is a burden on my heart, and I, I'm telling you because I want you to pray about it with us, uh, that more college ministries in, in our American Baptist Association will get involved with this because one thing that we're failing in is our inter interconnectedness. <clears throat> Excuse me. When, when you're on campus at Henderson and you go talk to Chi Alpha, BCM, any of these other ministries, even Wesley, they have a much better network of being connected together. And a lot of that's because of their structure and their, their uh, convention or association structure. But uh, one thing that we fail to do is keep our college ministers trained together, focused together, moving together. And that's something that I think my generation would like to see fixed. And so I want you to pray about that with me, that trips like this can become a group project, 
uh, it makes a huge impact when you take 40 people into an area that are ready to work and, and uh, you know, labor and don't mind some back pain uh, to get, get, some, get some stuff done for a church that is in an area where people are not receptive to the gospel. They're not receptive to um, any type of faith-based ministry. And, uh, you know, we, I think we had a, a pretty good impact on the community at Flagstaff. People definitely took notice. Uh, they definitely knew that something was going on. And so I'm hoping that in years to come that, that impact will continue uh, to, to last. This was not a mission trip where we expected many souls saved. And, and matter of fact, we don't know of any as of right now. But this is a, this is a community that's very hard-hearted against Christianity. Uh, it's not so much that they're like not wanting in th anything to do with spirituality. It's a very spiritual community. The missionary there used the term new age community. They're into mysticism and palm readings and things like that. But it's just, it's just that whole rel you know, tr relative truth. There is no absolute truth. There's multiple ways to God. There's multiple ways uh, to have a relationship and, and, and with God and go to heaven. And uh, that's, that can be tough. So pray for Sean Welchman, his family, Taylor. He's got two kids that he's raising in that community. They're in the schools. Taylor started teaching this year in, in one of the public schools. Um, I, I believe God's going to use them to do great things there. And uh, so uh, I just wanted to, if you would, join me, and let's just pray for that mission work. Let's pray that God will continue to have an impact in Flagstaff. And then uh, uh, other than that, I just want to say thank you to our church. You, you let us use a van to go out there. Uh, Brother Dick uh, and Brother Allen, they worked uh, really well with me on some insurance stuff that we had to coordinate. And, uh, man, y'all, in more ways than you may know, y'all have been very supportive in this trip. We had several other churches support this trip, and we're just so grateful that we were able to do it. So if you would, let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I just want to come before you and lift up Sean and Taylor uh, Welchman this morning, Flagstaff Family Church, the, the work that they're doing there, Lord. They're taking the gospel of Jesus to this community. And, Lord, uh, I know that they want to see salvations. I know that they want to see an impact made on that community, Lord. Um, it's hard to see a lasting impact from just a, a week-long trip there. But, Lord, I, I know that you can take little and make much. And, Lord, I just pray that this morning, this church prays this morning that you continue to do that and bless that opportunity that they have there. Bless that community. Lord, open their hearts and minds to receive what Taylor and, and Sean are preaching there in their church and that they continue to reach and make a difference for the kingdom of God. Lord, we're just so thankful for Jesus and the salvation that we have in in and through you, Lord, and the fact that we're able to worship you this morning as we continue to worship, let us be uh, joyful of heart knowing that God is working not only in hot springs but all over the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all would please stand up with us and worship. It on? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Is this on? Can you all hear me? <laughs> can you hear me? I don't think this one's on. Is this is this one on? It's not on. Is the red one on? Okay. There we go. <laughs> okay. Yay. All right, now we're going to sing. <laughs> you were the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory.
beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. Didn't want heaven without. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from every fear those who look on him are radiant they'll never be ashamed they'll never be ashamed this poor man and the Lord heard me and saved me from my enemies, the Son of God surrounds his saints, he will deliver them, he will deliver them, magnify the Exalt his name together, glorify the Lord with me. Come, exalt his name forever. Oh, taste and see that. 
number two here I've got some more students that are going to come out in a minute but um, we also want to just kind of update you on MBSF and our semester kind of what to look forward from us uh, moving forward this school year uh, one of the big things is the schools have started at different times so we have Henderson that's already going now and then Washita is coming in this week uh, so we did make some adjustments to allow for that uh, I'm going to share with those, share you, uh, share with you uh, those uh, changes as we go. We have another slideshow that uh, I kind of do whenever I go to a church and do a presentation, and so I want to share some of those with you. Um, do y'all have those, Jonathan? Yeah, there we go. Uh, so that's I've explained this before, but this is kind of our logo now uh, on campus, and uh, I'm I'm going to talk more about this in my message, but. Uh, that's our logo, and, and most people on campus see that, okay? Now, most churches don't understand that students nowadays, they don't know what MBSF means. The students that we're reaching are not all missionary Baptist students. Most of them are not. Um, now, some of, them, some, some of them on my leadership team, most of them on my leadership team are. Uh, but what we try to do is just try to make a connection with a person and sometimes that logo is the best way to do it because they're going to say, hey, what's that logo? And we say, well, that's our college ministry on campus. And uh, we do, through our MBSF Center, we do what's called Ascend. That's, that's just simply A-S-C-E-N-D, okay? And it, that comes from Scripture. We're going to read that today. Uh, but uh, we call those ministries Ascend Worship, Ascend Lunch. And it's just, try, it's just a, a simple way to reach students and uh, try to get more to the heart of, you know, we're a college ministry, we're, we're presenting Jesus on campus and the love of Christ on campus. And so that's what we do with that. Um, and some of our main events uh, are uh, obviously Ascend Worship, but then we have Ascend Lunch. We also do life groups. And uh, so all these slides in here are about, about those different ministries. And that's really our main three, all right? Now, during these first three weeks of school, we're going to do a lot of stuff. If, if you've been on social media, you've seen our first week schedule. Uh, we're actually, we actually have a, a second and third week schedule. We were going to put those on social media, but some of our other college ministries, are, I think, are still in some of our ideas. So we're actually not going to do that this week. We're just going to post each, our leadership team has that schedule, and uh, we're just going to post each event as we go and, uh, and get people connected. We made a lot of connections uh, this week just with our Henderson students, but I, I, I want to tell you, COVID's had its effect. Uh, in our heart start, uh, or not our heart start picture, but our heart picture, Henderson does a heart picture, like they form a heart with all the students the, of the freshman class and then take a sky picture of it. You can actually count the students in the picture this year. It's, it's, uh, it's a pretty low number. Now, that doesn't mean that enrollment is super low because there could be several online students. There was also some football team members that weren't in that. The freshman football players weren't in that picture. So there, there are more out there. But as far as on campus, it's, it's slim pickings. Uh, they're actually, everybody's pretty much got a single room this year. They're not doubling up. If you requested a roommate, they gave you a single room. Um, and you're paying the cheaper rate for, this, for the single uh, at Henderson. Now, Washita is different. They're gonna, they're, they require their students to live on campus, so they're probably going to have a pretty normal enrollment. They did last year. But um, I've shared this with the church before. We have a difficult time at Washita because they're a closed campus. 
So this year they're bringing, they didn't do it last year, but this year they're going to do it again. It's called Spotlight on Washita, or Spotlight on Arkadelphia. But basically it's just an opportunity for us to go on the campus, set up a booth, and we start handing out as much information as we can. Uh, we have three students on our leadership team that are on Washita, um, Washita's campus. Bryce, who's leading worship, is one of them. That's what he's going there for, to be a worship uh, leader. He's getting his degree in that. Then we have a girl named McKenna from Claren near Clarendon, Arkansas. And uh, then we have another girl named Jenna Barnes, uh, who's on campus there as well. Those three students are going to be working that booth Tuesday night, and they're going to be helping me reach, reach students on that campus this week. So we need your prayers Tuesday uh, for that event that we'll have opportunity uh, plenty of opportunities to visit with those students. Um, me and Brother Mark were talking before church, and, and he kind of alluded to this. Just because it's a Baptist school doesn't mean everybody's saved over there, all right? Uh, nowadays, you can pretty much figure that there's a lot of them that aren't, okay? A lot of them are playing church. A lot of them are checking a box. Uh, a lot of them are appeasing mom and dad, and they're just going to a school because it's a good school, not necessarily because their, their faith is directing them. And so uh, we, we want to reach those students. Uh, Jenna, uh, who's on our leadership team, and, and she plays piano for a church in her hometown, so she couldn't be here today. She was, she was saved shortly before she started college. Both her mom and her dad are, are non-believers and pretty adamant about not believing. And so uh, those students are out there. And they're on both campuses, but, um, you know, we have a difficult time reaching those ones in Washington, so pray for us this week. We're going to have a, we're going to have some opportunities. Last year was kind to us. We had, we had a really good group of Washington students join us last year, and it was really encouraging to see that. Um, I would say it's close to half. Half of our group last year was Washington students, and I, I don't know if it's, I don't, in my in my time of when I was a student there to now, it's, it hasn't been like that. Now, when Allison was there, it, it probably was. Uh, but it's, it's been a while. So uh, that's, that's a breath of fresh air, knowing that we have students coming into Washita that don't have to choose us. They have campus ministries that they can be a part of. But they're giving us a shot. And so that, that says some things. And, and I've gone out of my way uh, to... Uh, to break some rules at Washita. <laughs> I've, I've gotten in trouble, church, so I'm sorry. But I've done, I've passed out flyers on Washita's campus and gotten in trouble for it. Um, but I was willing to break the rule until I was, my hand was slapped. And I decided not to make a mat. So, um, but last year, man, they, they did us a big service. They, they allowed us to put a brochure in every single freshman welcome bag. And so we got to touch touch base with every single freshman last year but spotlight is normally our opportunity and so we need a big opportunity this Tuesday I'm so excited for the school year uh, our theme which you're going to hear more about in a minute um, we're, we're using the same one we had last year it's on a banner in front of our stage if you come to our worship building and and I and I've said this to several of you but I want to say it publicly now if you want to come see what we're doing come see what we're doing uh, Kenny and and Stacy were there this last Tuesday. They got to see some of the some of the tournaments we did. We did a small devo, and we're going to do that again this week. Just a small devo, and uh, then we're going to do some fun stuff. This week we're tie dyeing after Tuesday worship. So we're going to do a, do a little devo and uh, kind of you know let those students that are coming in for the first time this week know what we're about, and then we're going to tie dye some T-shirts. Uh, last time we did this, we had every single person there stay to tie-dye a shirt. And all we do is we just buy, we buy those cheap, you know, like what I'm wearing, those little cheap shirts that you, you know, guys wear under their button-ups. I hope you're wearing one under your button-up. But <laughs> I have to. But anyway, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Now, next week, our third week, we'll kick off our, we'll do our worship kickoff. We'll have the full band up there. We'll do a full worship set and, and, and more in-depth teaching and preaching. I want you to pray for our life groups. We're doing those different this year. Uh, we've, been, we've been approaching those 
from a perspective of just trying to get a bunch of people together and have a Bible study. That's really not the concept that we had in mind. Life groups doing life together. So we're changing those up and uh, our leadership team students are going to be the ones that are directing those life groups. Their, their mission is just to find three to four people that will meet with them at breakfast, lunch, or dinner, have a devotional, and visit and talk and just and then maybe build some friendships, and outside of that, hang out more, okay? That's, that's as about as simple as we can make it, and that's what we're trying to do with that. We have so many students that, that they're coming into college, and they're distracted. They're trying to reinvent themselves. They're, I mean, they're just on guard even. They, they, they don't want to have personal conversations. They don't want to be asked intentional questions. And so the less abrasive we can be, we're not, we're not trying to, we're not trying to, we're not afraid to hurt people's feelings, okay? Because the truth, the truth about Jesus hurts sometimes, okay? But we're trying to find less abrasive ways to reach people, soften them up a little bit so that they're more receptive. And, and the best way that, that I can think about this is, is a biblical example with planting seed, Right? You want the ground to be receptive. I have a neighbor right now who, who has an okra field that he planted this year, and he said that the ground underneath where he, where he plowed it has gotten really compact, and so next year he's going to have to plow deeper. Okay, That's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to plow a little deeper to get that ground a little softer so that it will you know, accept the seed better. And so just pray for us as we continue to do that. Hannah and Kelly are going to come out. They're going to talk to you together. They're actually a couple, okay? They met each other at MBSF, and uh, they've never done this before. They're, they're, they're both kind of shy. Uh, but th- most likely, folks, if, if, Kelly, if Kelly walks the walk and talks the talk, they're probably going to end up married. So <laughs> I told them, I said, I think this would be a great opportunity for you guys to kind of bond through talking about what MBSF is, how it's impacted you. And so they're going to both share with you a few things that MBSF has done, done for them. And, uh, and, and I hope that you all be encouraged by this. After they're done, we'll have one more worship song, and then we'll move forward with, some, some, with a sermon, okay? Howdy. Uh, I'm Kelly. This is Anna. And we're going to talk about how MBSF has impacted us. MBSF has given us friends that will last a lifetime. It has given us each other and memories that have made our college experience something to share about. Uh, it has given us a place to grow in our faith, worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and a chance to lead and serve. And lastly, MBSF has created a space for us to be ourselves as well as support us in our studies through college life. Amen. How about now? Hey, there we go. <laughs> when the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's a word that will bless you.
I gave, uh, I gave my report a little earlier, and so, uh, but one of the traditions we have at MBSF, I say tradition lightly, it's just something that I like to do, is we have students read scripture, normally my text through the service, which is something we do here. Uh, Maddie's one of our student leaders, and I've asked her just to share with you a little bit from, from her heart about our theme uh, for last year and this year, which is we're more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. Uh, which comes from Romans chapter 8, and uh, she's going to read my text and, and then and have a prayer before our message. So y'all give her your attention, all right? Everything, everything for this baby. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I, I'm not a singer. I've never used a microphone. Okay. <laughs> So, as he said, our theme is we are more than conquerors through um, Jesus who loves us. And how I take that is is that um, we are more than conquerors when we um, overcome our trials and tribulations through Jesus' love, like Christ-like love. And that is kind of what I'm going to talk about, how we did that last semester. And last semester we did that through serving. We served so much because last semester was one of the hardest semesters that we had just because of all the restrictions that we had. So we served to make a healthy and loving environment for everyone that we could who came in our doors. And how I really want to implement that this semester is by outreaching to as many people as we can. And as those restrictions start to lift, bring more people into our MBSF Center and just love on them and show them Christ-like love. Show them that we love them, I love them, and more importantly, Jesus loves them the most that anyone could ever. So I'm going to read his passage, and then I'm going to pray. So he's um, going out of John 3, 13 through 15. If you would like to open your Bibles and read with me. I'm reading out of ESV if anyone's interested. <laughs> no one has ascended into heaven except, for he de- except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. All right, and if you bow your heads, I'll go ahead and say a quick prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this day and bringing me here to Center Fork to just give a little blurb about how much um, about Ascend and what our theme is and thank them for so much support that they give us throughout the entire year. 
they are awesome, and I'm so thankful that they are the church that blesses us um, every time I step into that building. Um, also, I would like to just pray for Center Fork as a church through this um, year. Hopefully, they have all the growth and love and support that they need to be successful. Also, the same prayer for Ascend, that we're able to bring those people into our doors, open them, love them, and welcome them. And lastly, I pray for the message that Brother Daniel will be able to um, reach all of our hearts that will be open and um, accepting to listen and hear what he has to say. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, I hope that you've been blessed this morning. Take your Bibles, turn to John chapter 3. If you want to hold that spot that she read, that'd be great. Um, Brother Sean read to you uh, earlier Numbers 21, which is uh, inspir- inspiration, really, um, what Jesus is, is talking about there in, in, in verse chapter, uh, verse uh, 14. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I have a bit of a thought this morning. We're not, we're not going to... We're not going to preach a, a full sermon here, okay? I, I, I went to preach at a church a couple weeks ago, and I gave a pretty lengthy report, and I said, I'm going to preach a sermonette, okay? I figured out that that gets me out of trouble, Brother Scott, because if I preach 30 minutes, that's a sermon, right? If I go 10, that's a devotional. So sermonette, little sermon, all right? Little sermon, all right? So if, if I chase some rabbits or if I, if I go a little, little long, 20 minutes, we're good. I said sermonette, okay? So, but we may, we may, uh, we may get breezed through this, but uh, we, we were able to take a group yesterday to uh, Amplify. If you're not familiar with Amplify, it's, it's basically just a Christian concert venue. It's Woodstock for Christians. <laughs> Woodstock for Arkansas Christians. Uh, believe it or not, there were people there with their shirts off. It was uh, pretty insane watching this, but it was raining. We'll cut them some slack. I think they just got tired of wearing a wet, a wet shirt, but I really wish they would have kept their shirt on because all that greasy food we ate there the other day was a little hard to keep down in some of those moments. But when you're at Amplify, there's, there's a big stage, big screens, and, and I mean, you do not have to get very close to that place to hear and see what's going on. It's a very large display, and it's that way for a reason, right? They're, they're trying to get people's attention. And as I was thinking about um, my, my text for this morning, it really just kind of worked well. Um, I told you I was going to talk about our, our logo there, and I may have said this before, um, but I chose, I chose that symbol, that chevron, for a reason. Um, some people see that, they associate it maybe with the military, um, it's, it's not for me. I was just trying to find something that looked a little bit like our landscape. Uh, we're got the battle of the ring, brother Mark, you know, Washtal versus Henderson. There's the valley there that everybody, uh, plays in and we're up on the hill. We're kind of up on top. Our building was built by Baron Cross a long time ago, the, the front side of it. And it was kind of designed to look like a lighthouse to, to be something that, that people see and it catches their eye. People still to this day ask me if it's a greenhouse or a swimming pool. And I tell them, no, we, do, I, we, we don't have a swimming pool in there, but we do have worship and we want you to come. So I was trying to figure out something that kind of went along with that. And Brother Scott and Brother Sean have just gone through the same process with getting our new logo, which I love here at Center Fork. I love that logo. I appreciate the hard work they put into that. It's great. And, uh, but I also wanted to find something that I could use to explain to students what, what I'm trying to do in my relationship with them. And, and it's right there in, in verse 13 that we read. Only one has ascended, Jesus. And so for us, it's, it's immediately to Jesus. Who is Jesus to you? What has Jesus done for you? What do you believe about Jesus? And, and for, for me, it's, it's about understanding, do they have a relationship with Jesus? And then, do they have someone discipling them? Helping them to continue in their walk with faith and follow Jesus. So, that logo for me is just a simple strategy reminder for me. 
is to remind me that my job is kind of like a mountain guide. I'm not always at the top of the mountain or in front of the pack. Matter of fact, I prefer not to be, if you didn't know that about me. I like these students doing it. I like encouraging them and being their biggest cheerleader so that they're out there on the front lines battling it out. And it's not that I'm not afraid to be there with them because sometimes the mountain guide's got to be right there with them, shoulder to shoulder. But sometimes I'm in the back of the pack too trying to help people catch up. Calling the rally call, getting them to charge. And then sometimes I'm in the middle. And I'm just saying, hey, just keep following that person. Just keep doing what they're doing. They're doing a great job. But our ultimate example is always Jesus. So we have logos, don't we? When I was at Amplify yesterday, that's all I saw were logos. Presentations, images, logos, advertisements, symbols. Symbols. Now, we were at a Christian concert, and so all those symbols were ways to draw people's minds and hearts back to their relationship with Christ or some type of ministry that's done for the love of God and Jesus Christ. One of the biggest symbols that Amplify yesterday, other than the logo for Amplify, was John 3.16. Some people know about that ministry. It's a drug rehab ministry done in northeast Arkansas, and uh, they've had a lot of success. There were about 200 of their people there yesterday, men from their ministry, parking people, you know, trying to talk to people about Jesus. They're, they're very passionate, and I love being around them. They're, they're very encouraging to me. Um, but I couldn't help but think, you know, like even when we go home, even when we're sitting in our living room, even when we're walking through Walmart, we are surrounded by these symbols. Some good, some not so good. Some just, eh, they're kind of like the Beach Boys. Like they're not bad, they're not good, they're just kind of there, right? <laughs> so we're surrounded by all these symbols and people are just being bombarded by all these images. But what's the most important image that they need to see? Jesus. And so I want to ask a simple question today as we start with this scripture. Are we presenting the only one symbol that truly matters in this world? And I hope that you understand. I'm not trying to diminish Jesus Christ by saying he's a symbol. Because he's so much more than that. And we're going to talk about that today. But he is the only thing that truly matters. Doctrine matters, the Word of God matters, but it all centers around Jesus Christ. And so if we have a college ministry that this church is the sponsor of and sending church of, how can we be faithfully confident in that ministry if it's not about Jesus? I've failed in my job if it's not about Jesus Christ. If every student that comes in through comes in and through our doors, if I'm not asking them, who is Jesus to you? You should fire me. On those grounds, primarily. All right? Understand that. If I'm not doing that job, please ask me to leave. I know that's not a problem. I know you'll do that. Brother Scott's already told me. In John chapter 3, verse 13, we see a very important teaching about Jesus. No one has ascended into heaven except he who, ha who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. There's only one person who is the bridge, the ladder between this world and the heavenly one. This realm and the heavenly realm. This life and the life eternal. And that's Jesus Christ. Only he knows the mysteries of heaven. Only he could speak to the mysteries of God. What is the will of God? What does God want you to do? And we got some really great material. We got a whole book full of several other books. A canon of, of the word of God that speaks to Jesus being this bridge. He came. 
He came to earth several times, even before the incarnation. Only he can go back and forth. And the disciples even saw him on the Mount of Transfiguration, bringing heaven down to earth for just a moment. A glimpse of what it's going to be like at his second return. I can't even imagine. I really can't. The more I study the Bible, the more I realize I, I, don't, I don't know anything. There's a God. His son is Jesus. And he came to die for us. We have the word to teach us. And we should study that word. We should try to know everything about it we can. But folks, that's about all I got right now. I'm just like you. I have to take one verse at a time. One word at a time. Learning, figuring this out. Jesus is the only one who has ascended, come from heaven, and goes back to it. And if you want to be on that bridge, if you want to climb that ladder to heaven, it's got to be through Jesus. There is no other way. And that's what I meant when I said we live in a world that doesn't like abrasive doctrine, that doesn't like abrasive theology and teaching, because they don't want to hear that they can't get to heaven by being good. They don't want to hear that their grandma or grandpa who was atheist and died isn't going to heaven. They don't want to hear that. I wouldn't want to hear that. I really can't blame them. Because it saddens me to know that there's people that I care about that aren't going to be in glory with me. There's people right now that I care about that are not saved people. And it breaks your heart. But the truth is, Jesus is the bridge. Jesus is the door. And I'm saying things that he said. I just said it was a sermonette, so I'm not going to go into all that, okay? Look it up on your own. Verse 14. We have here the only symbol that matters. Now, as you read this story, I want you to picture what those Israelites were experiencing in the desert. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. This, this conversation that Jesus is having with Nicodemus here isn't a bunch of random verses that stand on their own. They do that. But they're all woven together. It's all, bringing, it's all coming to a point. And unfortunately, we're just looking at the middle part today. But it's a really great point that he's making here. No one has ascended but the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So why has the Son of Man ascended and descended? Why has he done all this? That's right. A lot of great, a lot of great things being said. Can you imagine those Israelites? I can imagine them because I'm like them. God, why aren't you doing this for me? God, why? Do you know what you're doing? I'm, I met my, one of my new best friends. We met on the mission trip. His name's Logan. Logan's from California. He's kind of a hippie. But he's a saved believer now. He's, he's a Christian, and he, he loves the Lord. He's serving at a church in Texas as a worship pastor. and He had this saying all week, and when you're hanging around college students and high school students, and you, you get the vibe pretty quick. These, these kids are they're, they're a little crazy. And, and you got to be a little crazy to want to work with them, okay? But he would say this. They, they'd start doing something and making jokes, and he'd be like, Daniel, these kids are out of control. And, of course, they are. They're out, they're out of control. I'm not their mom and dad. I'm not going to spank them. Most likely their mom and dad have never spanked them. And that's probably what they need. They're out of control. They're hyper. They're excited about life. A little out of control. That's what these Israelites were. That's what we are today. We're out of control. We get so caught up about what we want and what we feel is right that we make a whole life and build a whole life around that. And we say, God... Why aren't you doing this for me? God, why, why can't I have this? Why did you say this when I really want to do this? This feels right. I want to continue doing this. 
complaining against God, complaining against godly leadership. So this goes on enough and God decides to do what he always does with sin. See a great teaching here. What is God's reaction to sin? Judgment. Punishment. And so he sends these snakes into the camp. And these snakes are a form of God's judgment. Most definitely, make no doubt about it. Those snakes are there to judge. Am I going to bite you or I'm not? Snakes are still doing that today, aren't they? Some, some are nice and they give you a warning. But even they'll bite you too, right? Snakes enter the camp and they start biting people and these people start realizing maybe we shouldn't have been complaining. Maybe we should have been following God and his commandments. Now I'm simplifying way too much probably. It's way more dramatic than that in scripture in that time period. These people are fighting for their life. These, these, these people were desperate to see their mom healed, their little brother rescued, saved from the venom of these snake bites, to be saved from the judgment of God. And so they do what most Baptists do when they realize they're wrong, they start begging. Oh Lord, help us, right? God, help us correct the situation. And I don't mean to make fun. Like, they're, they are sincere in this. In the, in the deepest parts of their heart, they want healing. They want rescue. And God, as only God can do, sees a great opportunity to interject what's going to happen with Jesus. He says, Moses, I want you to put a serpent on a stick and lift it up. Take the... Take the thing, the symbol that is bad, and put it on a stick, and we're going to make it good now. We're going to redeem this symbol of the snake. And so if you look at the snake after being bitten by the snake, you live. Sin is a terrible, terrible thing, isn't it? It was, it was out of control in Jesus' day. And it's out of control now. But it's fenced in now. It's got a barrier now. It's not completely out of control. It just seems like it is. Because God sent the Son of Man. The Son of Man descended so that he could ascend, not by himself, but with others. We have a symbol that matters, but it is also so much more than that. This verse is a direct connection to how God deals with sin and rebellion. He does judge it, but he also provides grace. Grace, mercy, kindness in the midst of chaos. Look at verse 15 with me. That whoever, why was the Son of Man lifted up? so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, I'm going to be like that serpent. I'm going to take on sin so that others can look at me and live. I'm going to take on sin. Not just your sin, Nicodemus, but everyone's sin. So that I can help you live. Make no mistake, Jesus is telling Nicodemus this so he can witness to Nicodemus. He can see Nicodemus come to him as his Savior. So it's a really great gospel conversation. I love John chapter 4, the next chapter where Jesus has another gospel conversation with a completely different kind of person. But here you've got Nicodemus. He's educated and he thinks he knows everything. That sound familiar? That sound like some college students? They th they're educated. They think they know something. I, I, truth is, I don't know your heart this morning. I don't, I don't know every experience you've had. I can, I can make judgments up here because it's funny. Okay? I'm doing it as a joke. The truth is, I don't know. 
I don't know if you're saved or not. Some of you I've known for a long time now. I don't know if you're saved or not. It just may appear that you are. Only God truly knows your heart. And only you, and only you know if God truly knows your heart. And so the, the simple message this morning, you, you drove to church this morning just so you could hear, Jesus will let you live. <laughs> Look to Jesus and you'll live. And that may sound simple to you, but it is the most profound thing that has ever happened in all of time. Look at Jesus and live. Look at Jesus and find healing from your sin. Look at Jesus and find hope, not wishful thinking, a confident belief that you know that you have a Savior that loves you, that has died for your sins, paved a way, paid a way for you to have an eternal life with God. Why was the Son of Man lifted up? Because he loves you, of course, but also because he wanted to give you eternal life. What does that mean? Whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Another way of saying that word eternal life could just be the life in the age to come. The life in the age to come. That's another way that could be translated. That means there's a life coming that's better than this one. And you can have a part in it. Because you cross the bridge with Jesus holding your hand, you get to be a part of that life. A life without sin, a life without pain, a life without regret, a life of hope, a life of eternal love, forever love, forever kindness, forever joy. The things in this life that we get just a small taste of, like this sermon, just a small part of it, we get more, much more in heaven, much, much more. Does that mean, though, that God's just made his eternal life available to us in the future? Or is it available to us now? I would say to you this morning, and if you want to argue about this later, we'll do it. I would say to you this morning that you can experience this life a little bit now. What are the greatest gifts that we have? Faith, hope, love. How about Galatians chapter 5, the fruits of the Spirit? How do you experience those? I had an atheist tell me one time that he could experience those. He could have the gifts of the Spirit right now active in his life. And I said, no, you can't because you're not saved. You don't have the Spirit. You want to experience eternal life now, get to know Jesus. Ask Him to be your Savior. Start following Him. Romans 8, the Holy Spirit will dwell within you. He'll seal you in Christ. You get to start experiencing that life a little bit now. You get to have a little bit more joy, but the perfect joy, the joy that comes through salvation, the joy that comes through knowing Jesus. You get to have a little bit more patience. Okay, Not how long you can wait, but what you do while you're waiting. You get to have a little bit more love in your life, agape love, not just from, the God, from, from God our Creator, and Jesus Christ, but you get to learn how to love others the way God loves you. That life begins now, as soon as you receive Jesus. I encourage you this morning, taste and see that it's good. Eternal life is waiting. It's waiting for you now. Are you going to experience it? But the only way is through Jesus. Now, I keep saying that. Jesus is the only way. That's because this symbol is the only one that offers life, that truly offers substance and life. And it's because Jesus said it. He laid his claim on it. John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's a great verse that many people use in evangelism because it's showing that Jesus is the way. This is the claim that refutes all other claims. This is the claim that Christianity stands on and says, nope, it's not Buddha. It's not the Hindu gods. It's not atheism. Make no mistake, atheism requires a lot more faith than Christianity. It's not those other things. It's Jesus. 
Because as Christians, we have that confident belief, that hope to say, it is Jesus that is the way. Jesus is the way. This is the only symbol that offers life, but it's also the only symbol, symbol that offers power. Power. 1 Corinthians 1.18 tells us Jesus is, or explains, that Jesus is the power of God for salvation. It is only Jesus that has the power. His symbol on the cross, his symbol as the resurrection and the life that offers us power in this lifetime. I use that word power like it was used in the New Testament as in dynamos, dynamite power. It's explosive power. But I would also tell you this morning that it's also ekousia, which is authoritative power. And Jesus laid his claim on that too, believe it or not. Matthew chapter 28, verse 16, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Not Daniel Ward. Not Sean, not Scott, even though we're, we're great guys that love the Lord and trying to serve him the best that we can. But it's not our power that we stand on, it's Jesus' power. This church, its power that it stands on is all centered in Jesus. It's his authority. Why? Because he said it was. I'm not one to argue with God. I've seen enough people make that mistake. In my youth, I've made that mistake. Some of you say, well, you're still young, Brother Daniel. Yeah, I am. I'm younger than you. Okay? But I'm learning. I'm not going to argue with God. It's his authority. It's his power. Now, some, somebody, Brother Sean, somebody after church is going to hear me say something, and they're going to are you arguing with God? It's Jesus' authority. It's his power. It's his life. Believe it or not, Jesus is the original symbol. You know that? John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, capital W, Jesus. He's the original symbol. He's the only one that matters. When it says that we were created in the image of God, both man and female, I believe... Both, both genders, male and female, I am making that claim this morning. There are two genders, male and female. And they are created in the image of God. I believe the biggest part of that image, the influencer of that image, is Jesus. As man and woman this morning, you embody the symbol of Jesus because you are created in his image. His symbol is everywhere, folks. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. We can't run from the symbol of Jesus. It's there when we wake up and look in the mirror. It's there when we look in the faces of our children, our grandchildren, our wives, our sisters, our brothers, our moms, our dads. Jesus' thumbprint is all over humanity. That's why he says, I am the authority. I am the power. I am the life. He's the original. It's pretty obvious that we should be taking this symbol seriously and we should be taking it to the world. Not that it's already there. We're just like those mountain guides. We're just saying, look, follow the symbol. Follow the cross. Follow Jesus. Follow the word. It all leads to the same place. Jesus Christ the Savior of the world, the Son of Man who was lifted up on a stick, became sin for us, our sin for us, so that we could come to know Jesus as Savior. No one will find their way to the Savior. I'm not going to say no one. Maybe there's, there's people out there that have, but I say that this morning hoping that you understand most people do not find their way to the Savior unless they're told about Him. And I can prove that with Numbers 21. It's in, the, it's in the, Jesus' own illustration. I'm going to steal from that preacher this morning. Jesus said, 
The snakes bit them, and they had to look at the pole and live. How'd they know where the pole was? How'd they know to go to the pole and look and live? Word of mouth. Or somebody took them there. Somebody said, brother, strap on my back, man. I'm taking you so you can look and live. Sister, come on. I'll hold your hand. I'll walk with you so that you can go to the Savior and look and live. When are God's people going to start asking people, are you ready to look and live? Are you ready to go to the Savior? The Word of God is so full of rich teaching. But none of that is going to make a difference in a person's life unless they know Jesus. If they've never looked and lived, the rest don't matter. You've got to get that part first. When they come in the doors of this church, look and live. When you leave this church and you go to work, look and live. When you're mowing your yard and you have that conversation with your neighbor, look and live. Quit worrying about whether or not they join the church and worry if they're going to heaven. It's time to say, look and live. Because only Jesus can save you. Only Jesus can save them. I'm sorry, I didn't know I was going to get emotional this morning. <laughs> I just realized, though, all the faces I've seen this week that don't know Jesus. And I hope that they understood what we were trying to tell them. I hope that they got it. I hope that they find their way. Heaven and life are found in Jesus, our Savior. And we all need to submit to this message of salvation. We've got to quit trying to save people on our own and point them to Jesus. We can't save anyone. A wise college pastor, the wisest that I know and that I've seen, told me one time, he said, Daniel, I don't, I don't put a lot of stock into the students that parents or pastors bring by my office. And I was kind of shocked by that. And he said, the reason why is in my experience, the students that have to be brought to my college ministry are not normally the ones that stay. It's the ones that have the drive and the motivation that come. That really shook me for a while. Because starting out here, like, I, that was basically how I made contacts, was through other people. And I still do that to some degree. Somebody's going to give me a phone number, or introduce me to a student, I'm not going to not love them. I'm, I'm not going to shy away from inviting them and talking to them. But it's, it's been a pleasure as a college minister to see Students grow in their faith and realize that they can do so much more. They can conquer because of the love of Jesus. And then it's been even more of a pleasure to see students like Andy, who've accepted Christ in our ministry, and that fruit comes forward. But it's not because I made them do anything. It's because I just pointed the way. And it took a while for me to realize that I had to just point the way. That's all I could do. I can't force them. I can't push them. I can't chew them out. I can't even really give them a pep talk because they, a, pep, a pep talk doesn't really do it. All I can do is point the way and hope that they choose right. And that's, that's what breaks our heart, isn't it? Because... We can't make them. As bad as we want them to, they have to choose it on their own. We pray for them. We love them. But they have to choose at the end of the day. 
What have you chosen this morning? We're going to have a song of invitation. I'm going to turn the service back over to Brother Sean, Scott, whoever wants to take over. And they're going to receive you this morning during this song. If you want to know more about Jesus, if you want to come to have a relationship with Him, you do that this morning during this song. And I want you to think about that choice that you've made as I read this closing scripture. Zach Williams was the closing musician, artist yesterday evening. He's one of my favorites right now for two reasons. He's a Baptist and he's an Arkansas boy. But he sang a song about Jesus yesterday and how Jesus is the example that we follow. Jesus is the one. And in that song, he makes a statement that says, the evidence is there. The evidence is there. You just need to believe in Jesus. So I read this verse this morning to give you confidence if you know Jesus, but to show you what it's about if you don't know Jesus. The evidence is there. But verse 1 of Hebrews 11 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, a confident belief, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. But by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. The evidence is there. You can keep arguing and struggling with the evidence all you want, but the testimony of the past and the testimony of what's going to happen is there. Are you going to step out on faith and accept it? We're using faith every day. We're putting faith in some symbol or something or some person. But it simply comes down with salvation. Are we going to put our faith in Jesus? Let's stand and sing as we close. I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'll bring you more than For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all.